something dawned on me the other day and I told my class about it. Um, and one of my students asked me to create a video about it so they would be able to remember what I said. So here it is. Um, basically, the story I was telling was how I was late to class during an exam day because the traffic in Miami was terrible. So I was a few minutes late to class during an exam day. And I wanted to make up for that for the students because I knew they would be concerned that they would not have enough time to answer all the questions on the exam since I was a few minutes late. So I said, essentially, you know, I'll give you guys essentially what was equivalent to 10 points extra credit, right? So basically they could miss two questions, like essentially free of charge because of that 10 points extra credit. Well, in the end, you know, they took their test and I was able to give them the extra time to make up for the time I was late. And most people finished early anyways. So the end result of that was that there was great inflation on that exam. So the historic average for that exam is a pretty easy exam. And the historic average was about 80 for that type of student, group of students that take that course. So typically on that exam, they have an 80 as an average. This time the average was 90, exactly 10 points higher, which reveals that, of course, the 10 points I gave weren't, they weren't necessary, right? The students had performed at their maximum ability, you know, kind of in line with the historic average and the 10 points I gave just inflated their grades. So now almost everyone had a very good grade on the test and, you know, full half the class had an A. So that was pretty, um, you know, pretty disappointing from my end because I realized, oh, I didn't need to give those points. You know, I was overly concerned about something that in the end didn't matter. I gave the 10 points and now I wish I could take them back because I've inflated the grades. And grade inflation isn't great, right? It's it's not wonderful because, you know, you should have typically um, C students, right? B students, A students. If everyone, you know, has an A, then there's grade inflation, right? And there's there's no average student then, right? At least the grade doesn't show average, right? Because A says you're a superior student, you know, and there should be average students at every university, right? So for example, here's this chart of grade inflation at Harvard. You know, now at Harvard, almost everyone has an A average, right? And of course, you know, what is that, you know, due to the idea of grades? It's silly, right? There should be C students at Harvard. The average student at Harvard should have a C. And then the people who are above average should have B's and superior students at Harvard should have A's, right? Um, the fact that no one has a C at Harvard, you know, is kind of a misrepresentation of what it means to have a C, B, and A grade scale where, you know, C stands for average. So regardless, I thought, you know, the points I gave, it's very akin to the government giving out money in our economy, right? Um, and I don't mean to say this like in a way where I'm saying that it's bad for the government to create money because actually the government creates all our money. For us, right? In, the, uh, in a place like the United States, we have a fiat currency, it's called. Essentially, it's a currency that's not backed by anything other than the faith and credit of the United States. And so, because of this, the government can create money anytime it wants. Just like I was able to create the points that I gave my students. I came into class and I said, geez, I'd like to give them some points to offset me being a little bit late. So, I just gave 10 points. You know, here's 10 points, you know, no problem. I didn't need to come up with a way, like, how can I afford these points? Where will I get these points from? Who will I borrow, you know, points from to be able to give my students 10 points? I didn't have to fret over these things. But that's how you hear the media talk about the national debt all the time, right? You tend to hear people in the media talk about the national debt as if, you know, they say things like, well, how can we try to repair the roads and bridges in this country? Like, where will the money come from? Uh, the money will come from the government just going into a computer and telling the provider of the bridge or the people, the companies that work on the bridge, here's your payment for doing the work on the bridge. It's that simple, right? If the government wants to buy planes from plane producer like Boeing, it just, you know, tells Boeing we need, you know, 10 jets and then it just transfers the money into their account. It's just numbers in a computer and the government can just credit their account the money. It's that simple. So the reality is just like I was able to, you know, manufacture points in, in a moment's notice, you know, and to give to my students, the government can do the same with the money, right? The only danger is you can create inflation, right? If there's too much money chasing too few things, you create inflation. And that's exactly what happened in my class, right? I created great inflation simply because I gave points to a class that didn't really need them. They were already performing at their maximum potential and that potential was already right where it needed to be. The extra points I gave did nothing but inflate the grades. However, I give points to classes sometimes in the form of curve if the class is underperformed, right? And of course, I don't just give points in a, in a simplistic way. I actually use a, a model that kind of 
a linear model that gradually tapers off the amount of points that are given as you go up the grade scale. But that's not really the point. The point is mainly that I do just give points in those instances, but I don't create grade inflation in those cases. Why? What's the difference? Well, in the case where a class underperforms the historic average, in other words, they're not meeting their potential, right? Then I might have a 50 as the average grade, and a 50 is normally an F nominally. So what I do is essentially is I build a curve that turns those F students into average students because they are the average student, right? If the average student has an F, then they deserve a C because they are average in that class at that moment in time. And the people who did better than that, they'll get like a B because they're above average. And the people who did way better than that, they'll get the A, so on and so forth. So basically when I do that, what happens is I have a normal grade distribution. I don't have an inflated grade distribution. I still have the kind of tiers, right? Above average students get the Bs, the superior ones still have As, the average ones still have Cs. And then the points I've given get absorbed into the system perfectly without creating grade inflation. And all they do is restore the normal thing that should be there, which is a normal grade distribution where the average student has a C, right? We don't want to give the average student an F, right? That you're saying basically they're below average performers, right? Or failing performance, and that's not right, right? Of course, some people don't get that, and maybe they disagree, but, but I think that's 100% correct, right? That the grade distribution, of course, just because by de definition, the average student should have a C, and then the average in a class should always be a C. So with that in mind, what's the difference between those two scenarios? In our economy, if we have the economy chugging along at its full potential, right? Like all the productive people in our society are being as productive as they can be and the resources are being used as efficiently as they can be. In other words, the economy is kind of at its maximum speed limit. You cannot keep pumping money into the system without creating inflation. You will then create inflation. Compare that to a situation, though, when we've had an economic downturn, like when we had the Great Recession. You saw the government pump trillions of dollars into the system, into the economy. Money they just made up and pumped into the system, and inflation did not rise. In fact, it helped keep the economy from going into a Great Depression, right? And there's the potential argument to be made that they could have given a lot more, that actually the economy did not grow fast enough. They could have pumped it further with money because inflation remained relatively low and they could have added more money to the system without you know, blowing up inflation. So essentially, we had too many productive individuals sitting on the sidelines who had been laid off, who their jobs had been cost because of the downturn, and we could have gotten them back to work faster and producing more for our country, bringing us back up to normal speed. So again, the economy can absorb that money because the definition of inflation is what? Too many dollars chasing too few goods, right? So if you can get the productivity of the society revved up with the money you give, then that can offset the extra money, right? If there are more things to buy, then the money can be met in the marketplace with things to purchase, right? It'd be like in the housing market. If you only have one house for sale and there's a bunch of people who want a house, that house is going to be very expensive, right? Because you're going to have to, what? All the buyers are going to have to compete for that one single house. But if there's a, you know, a hundred houses and only 50 buyers, right? Now you have way too much supply of homes and those houses will go cheap because buyers don't need to buy just one house. They can go and move on if they're not happy with the price for the one house that's for sale. They'll go to the next house that's for sale and so on and so forth, right? And there are more houses for sale than people interested in buying. So again, inflation works in two ways, right? Lots of money. That's sort of the demand side, right? Of things. And then the supply side is what there is to buy, right? So if, for example, you know, the pan during the pandemic, the economy shuts down in China and they stop producing things, they were sort of the factory of the world, right? They stopped making things. If everyone working in the West, in the United States, if they stop working and stop producing and goods and services aren't available and people are just sitting on cash, right, with nothing to spend it on, then whenever there is something that pops up that you can spend money on, the prices are going to get inflated, right? So, you know, the pandemic was a situation where we weren't being productive, right? The people were being put on the sideline. All the productive aspects of society were being sidelined. And because of that, the money supply that was available was too much for what was available to buy. So we ended up having inflation. And so the pandemic induced inflation. On top of that, of course, there was some money being given out to help people who are struggling. And so that increased the money supply at the same time, right? So you have these this double whammy. But the reality is, is that, of course, you know, if the system was chugging along at 
full employment and there wasn't a pandemic, you could also induce inflation by putting too much money into the system. So the trick of it is, is not, you know, where do we get the money to do these things? The question is, you know, you know, where should we spend the money, number one? And two, if we do spend the money, is it going to increase inflation or put pressure on prices trying to make them rise? That's the question, right? So, you know, the other thing to remember is that a large, large portion of the debt is held by Americans, first of all, right? So when people, when the government sells government bonds, many Americans hold those bonds, right? So the money that's being paid out is being paid out to Americans, for one. Um, but also, anytime the government has a deficit, whenever the government has a deficit, it means that the government has spent more than it has taken back in taxes, right? So think about that. If the government were to pay for everything that it spent money on through a tax, you know, tax system, right? So in other words, you know, we, we put money in welfare and then we tax people to pay the exact amount back into the system that we're paying out in welfare. If that's the case, we're at equilibrium, Right. And, you know, or it could be even a worst case scenario where the government actually is taking more from you in taxes and they have a surplus. You know, when I was a kid, we had a brief moment of surplus during the Clinton administration and people thought it was this great thing. Like, oh, we have a surplus. Well, if you actually think about it correctly, what that means is that we are taking more money from the citizenry than the government was giving back to them. So they were taxing more from the citizenry than they were spending. So that means they're taking the money from people's pockets in the form of taxes, and they're not spending it back into the economy. This is actually deducting or debiting our accounts, our personal accounts, essentially, from that perspective. And the opposite is true when the, when the country runs a deficit. So when the government spends money and doesn't take an equal amount back in taxes or some other revenue generating a scheme, you know, the reality is, is that that's money left in our pockets, right? Money that we, we have ownership over. Of course, that's a little bit of an oversimplification because there's also international trade and there is, uh, you know, a role there for like the trade deficit. But generally speaking, again, putting that aside, because as long as the trade deficit isn't bigger than the debt, then that deficit that the government runs is money that they're leaving in our hands that they could take back through taxes, right? So how does the money, how do, you know, if I, and this goes back to my analogy with my students in class, I gave them those 10 points creating great inflation. I could have pulled the points back. I could have come back to class the next day and said, you know what? I graded your exams. You did great. You didn't need the 10 points. I'm going to take the 10 points back. And how would have people felt about that? They would have been so angry, right? They would have said, you promised us those 10 points. Now we don't have the 10 points. You're taking 10 points from our grade. They would have been very angry. This is how people generally feel about taxes, right? <laughs> so you know, realize that if the government wants to, you know, deal with the deficit, if, if in other words, they've put too much money into the public's hands or into the system, and it's too much money out there, one way to get rid of the money or to take the money back out of the system, out of circulation, is to tax us, right? And, you know, if they tax us, and then they don't spend it back in, they could actually reduce the money sitting out there in the economy. Most of us would be pretty upset by that because we don't like paying taxes. Paying taxes is not fun, right? So it's ironic that we complain about the national debt and we complain about taxes, even though one way to offset the spending the government is doing is by paying more taxes, right? So we'd have this equilibrium. But again, I don't think it makes sense that we would want an equilibrium, right? Because again, unless there's inflation, the government should spend the money. It should you know, basically monitor inflation closely and carefully and then track that over time and make sure that the economy isn't heating up too much. But as long as it's not heating up too much and as long as there's still signs in the economy of weakness, then I think that government spending is not a terrible thing, right? It shouldn't be inherently terrible. Of course, you could waste money and spend it foolishly and that could lead to inflation. But there are ways you could spend money that could actually help fight inflation in the future. For example... Right? Inflation has occurred over time in the United States. This is the case in all countries pretty much, right? It's the only time you have deflationary periods tend to be during recessions, right? The other thing to think about is like, you know, there is some spending we've done that's been really great, right? So here's the a map of the interstate highway system. This spending, you know, and I'm sure the interstate highway system was extremely expensive, but guess what? That has raised the productivity of Americans because now trucks can bring goods to market from across the coast, right? So you can literally have a, a ship come into California and then those goods can be offloaded in a port, put on a truck, 
or on a train car and travel across the United States efficiently because of the interstate highway system, right? It's part of the reason why our country is so economically prosperous, right? So that's good spending because if you raise the productivity of the nation, you're able to absorb more money, right? Without creating inflation, right? There's more productivity, the economic pie expands, there could be more money in the system, we can all get richer without having inflation, we can be genuinely richer. So there's a good example, spending money on something like highways, right? Infrastructure in general, right? Anything that you do, like roads, schools, anything like that, that can expand the productivity, right, of the people living in the United States can make us richer and we can therefore have more money in our system without suffering from the effects of inflation, right? Um, one of my personal favorites would be to spend money on universities since I teach at a university, right? It would be great if schools could produce really productive citizenry, right? And if we have good schools, we can produce productive citizens who can go out there and raise the economic pie, right? Increase it, expand it. You know, look at Google, right? Google didn't take money from other industries when it became so dominant in our economy, right? Instead, it actually expanded the economic pie. It enabled all these people to open small businesses and to make money through advertising, that sort of stuff. And because of that, you know, the economy got richer overall. And again, we can absorb more cash, more spending from the government, even if that's the case, right? And again, all the money originates from the government, right? So every dollar that's spent was created in the Federal Reserve. It's just a keystroke in the Federal Reserve, right? So, you know, essentially the money that we use, it's unlimited. The U.S. government can pump the system full with money. The only risk is what? Inflation again, right? We don't want to have inflation. But remember that just because we have debt doesn't mean our country is going to suffer from debilitating inflation, right? Here we had debt that was greater than our GDP at the time. This is during World War II or the period shortly after World War II, right? And then gradually you saw that that began to come down. But the money that we spend here boosted the economy's productivity, right? So the economy could be more productive and we were able to absorb the cost and we could basically grow the economy enough that the debt compared to our gross domestic product was a smaller proportion, right? And we've been able to do that historically. So the general idea is that America's debt, you know, as much as people point to how large it is, um, it's actually pretty manageable compared to a lot of countries in Europe, right? And again, one way to get rid of some of that money is to tax it out of the system. Do you want to tax out the money out of the system? Would you really want to remove the debt? Because the government could do it. First of all, they could just, first of all, pay it all out immediately, right? The government could just, again, print money, as we say, and they could print money to get rid of the debt, right, overnight, could do that if they wanted to. But again, you know, another option would be, oh, well, if they printed money and they created inflation, they could remove it through taxes. But none of us want that. <laughs> and so, you know, we all don't like the idea of taxes, right? Um, not that you shouldn't tax things. There are lots of reasons to tax something. You can tax things you don't want a lot of, right? So if you think tobacco is bad for people, you could tax the tobacco industry, right? You could also uh, tax, you know, automobiles that tear up the roads and cause us to spend more money on infrastructure, right? So you could say, well, they have to pay a higher tax for those cars because they're tearing up the roads, right? But again, the generic or the general idea is that spending money, let's say, on healthcare, for example, like that could be a good thing for the economy, right? If everyone could uh, access high quality healthcare because we have really highly trained doctors and we have great hospitals and so on, that can increase the productivity of our society. It can also lower the cost that individuals have to spend on their health care, right? If the government is helping fund that, right? Of course, you know, you may say, oh, well, we're paying for that through our taxes and all that. Again, that's nonsense, right? The government can create dollars in the economy just like I created points from my class. I just say to the class, here, here's another 10 points, right? The only thing I have to worry about is inflation, right? I want to keep the great inflation low. So I should only do that in a system where, what, the money can do some good to help improve the productivity of the society. So the real trick of it is not to worry about where we're going to get the money to pay for things. It's to say what? You know, we can always have the money to pay for things. There's no limit to the money supply. The question is, what's worth spending money on? So we need to figure out what things will have dividends in the future that will make it worthwhile, right? Like if you pay to go to college, right? You're spending money on college, yes, but you'll have a degree and you'll probably earn more. So the question is, is that a valuable, worthwhile investment, right? If you go and learn a trade, you know, if you go to school to learn to be a mechanic or you go to learn to be a plumber, 
yes, you spent money to become a plumber, but if that career, that skill makes you more productive, you can easily pay for that spending without a problem, right? So same thing, you know, when we think about the money supply in the United States, we don't have to worry about where the money is going to come from. We'll always have the money. The only question is, how do we spend it in a way that avoids creating inflation, right? And as long as our economy isn't pumping along at maximum capacity, we can usually absorb more dollars safely. And that's really the thing to, to you know, think about and to remember that when the government's in deficit, we are in surplus. The taxpayers, we're in surplus. If the government wants to reverse that situation, one of the ways they could do it is by taxing us, right? Taxing us more than they give money back into the economy and through spending. And that would actually hurt us, right? It would hurt our bottom line. We would be losing money in the economy as individuals, sending it into the government for taxes to erase the, the national debt, right? But in the end, we would be paying the price while essentially the government is collecting money and not spending it back into the economy. So it would be coming out of our personal bucket of money, right? So our bank accounts would be less flush, right? So again, when you think about the deficit and say, well, somebody's got to pay it back eventually, you know, I, you know, I don't know that that's the case, right? And, and no one can say that, right? The bottom line is, is that we don't know um, how the spending will pan out in the future. You can make projections, of course, but, you know, when you think about spending, the main thing to think about is, is it reasonable to imagine that this spending in the long run will boost the economy, right? You hear people say that tax cuts will boost the economy because wealthy people will then re, you know, take that money that they save, they don't have to pay in taxes, and they'll put it into their businesses or they'll do some other spending that will help grow the economy. Um, other people say if you give it to poor people, poor people spend the bulk of the money that's given to them because they don't have enough money. So whatever comes in has to go out to buy food and clothing and shelter. It's because of that it really, you know, turns up the economy good, right? It gets a lot of money into the system because the money goes into their pockets and goes back into the economy into small businesses that are selling food and businesses that are repairing roofs and things like that. So giving, you know, the poor portion of our society or the middle class portion of our society more money, then they will spend it. That will stimulate the economy. So you hear that kind of discussion. And of course, the big one is infrastructure, right? If you spend to make the system better at able to produce more in the future, then we'll have a greater economic growth in the future. And of course, a deficit is only relevant when compared to our growth, right? So if we can produce more, then we can absorb more dollars. So again, if we can grow the economy, the deficit is less of a problem, right? So again, the way to think about it properly, again, is just don't forget, I can always make up points in my class to give to my students. I don't have to get them from anywhere. They're, they're just always there. It's also the same for the government when it comes to money. The government just makes up the money. It can do it anytime it wants, whenever it wants, however it wants. It doesn't need um, to go find the money to spend. It always has the money because we make our own money, right? It'd be different if we were Greece, right? Greece uses the euro. They don't produce the euro themselves. They can't control how the euro is created and spent in their economy exactly. So because of that, they have to be like households. They have to be careful how they spend, right? It's not the same for the U.S. government. We have a different system.